Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Claudia Rizzini. I am the Executive Director of the Rackley Fellowship Program at Harvard University. Today's presentation is by our Riemann and Bechtel Fellow for Music, Kaju Tan, an independent composer based out of Hong Kong. Kaju first began to learn how to play music when he was eight years old. He was taught the rules of Western classical music that dictated what music should sound like and how it should be played. Steeped in, music, in a musical world of perfectionism and stifled by the arbitrariness of these rules, Kaju began to imagine new possibilities through composition. Instead of seeing instruments as objects to make music in the tradition of, class, in the tradition of classical music, com music, composition allowed Kaju to redefine instruments as vehicle for sound that can be used to capture the natural flow of everyday soundscapes. His work thus embodies the chaos inherent in the natural world, breaking away from the traditional conventions of classical music to create new ways of tuning into the world around us. During his year at Radcliffe, Kaju successfully completed Zooplankton, a larger ensemble piece that embraces entropy and articulates it, articulates it through sonic expression. He continues to work on Reactions, an instrumental solo, solo series that draws inspiration from everyday forms of entropic patterns, such as stock, index, stock indexes and animal migration charts. Through both projects, he aims to broaden our aesthetic capacities for music and invite a deeper appreciation for the sounds of the wider world. Kaju has both an English name and a Chinese name. Some may think that adopting an English name is a way to assimilate to the Western world. However, it is a common practice for people in Hong Kong and it's a legacy of uh, its history as a former British colony. To his surprise, people in English-speaking countries most often refer to him by his Chinese name, while people in Hong Kong know him better with his English name, Kenneth. In any case, it is my great pleasure to welcome Kaju, or Kenneth Tan, to the podium. All right, um, so thanks, Claudia, for the introduction. And um, I would also like to thank all Redcliffe staff, um, Jean, Elizabeth, um, Alison, Maria, Kyla, Sharon, and my fellow fellows for contributing to an amazing year. So it's a truly memorable experience. OK, so before my talk uh, about my music, I would like to spend some time to explain a non-Western philosophical concept that serve as the basis for, my, uh, for most of my creative work. So the term universe, used in the title, is actually a translation of the Taoist, Taoist philosophical concept of the, um, well, universe. Uh, because there is no, no direct English equivalent to, to capture the exact meaning of these Chinese terms, so, and the universe is the closest translation. And using it in the title might be a little bit misleading because it suggests some sort of um, scientific direction that is not really aligned with my context of the talk today. So for online audience who are drawn to the talk because of their scientific connotation, I'm sorry. <laughs> but since you're already here, I hope you'll stay. Okay, so the main difference between uh, um, uh, the main difference that differentiates the Taoist universe from the um, Western understanding of universe is that it is a concept rather than a concrete object. So a simpler way to convey this concept is that, in, in one word, is that it might become some sort of like fate or karma, but they are not exactly the same. Um, fate or karma is some sort of like, um, it can be individualized, so you can stand from a third-person standpoint and point to that person and say, well, now this is his or her fate, right? But for um, Taoist universe, you can think of it as um, integration of, of fate into one large body of fate. 
So um, there is no longer individual items within the Taoist universe. So everyone, everything is a part of the universe, and you can no longer stand from a third-person standpoint and point to, and, and define one's fate. Um, and also, the fate itself, which means the Taoist universe, has a fate. So this makes defining Taoist universe particularly interesting because it creates a logical loop. The logical loop is like the Taoist universe is the fate of itself, all right? And, but what makes it even more interesting is that the implication of everything, everyone, is a part of the universe, and therefore, we are fundamentally equal. All right? So think of the universe as a piece of bread dough. Okay? If you pinch off two small nuggets out of the dough and shape one into a bear shape and shape one into a human shape, okay, they might look different on the surface. But fundamentally, they are the same in nature because we are just dough. Okay? And, um, and they are also the part of larger dough. So we are like all those nuggets, and we are equal in the grand scheme of things. So as a result, value judgments become insignificant. Because if we are equal, there are no comparisons. Okay? So there is no beauty, no ugliness, no whatever called good or bad. And what we'll have to do is to look at things based on their true nature. So this idea is, has, has a very great influence on my compositional approach. And of course, most philosophical concept has flaws, and I'm not an expert of it. So this Taoist philosophy is very complex. And what I've just talked about is, is just one of the very simple, simplest way to explain it. In fact, it can take up to several years for, 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 people, for, for a person who study Oriental philosophy to understand the basic of it. But if you are interested in this kind of philosophy, you can try reading the, reading the English translation of this philosophical word, which is called the Essay of, um, on the Uniformity of All Things. All right, so I hope I gave you a basic illustration of what it is, and I'm going to talk about my aesthetics, my compositional approach, and my music, and try to walk you through my thinking process under the framework of this philosophical concept. All right, so during a festival a few years ago, I had a casual chat with Lei Liang, who is a composer and a professor at UC San Diego, and who also holds a de degree from Harvard. And he told me that he was at a round table conference here at Harvard with all those inter interdisciplinary um, people, with big scholars, and then he was suddenly asked by one of them, why do you compose? And why it is important to compose new music in today's world? Now, then Li Liang turned to me and, and told me, you know, sometimes you have to be prepared to answer these kind of questions, right? You only have two to three minutes to impress all these people and get them know what you are doing. And composers always need opportunity. And you don't want any possible collaboration to, be, to slip away. I totally agree with him. And in fact, I, I have been preparing for the question since I decided to be a composer which is more than a decade ago. And I still don't have a solid answer for this because the world is evolving so fast and my thought on this question is always changing too. But the basics are there. So why is, why is it important to compose new music? Asking this question is like asking myself to think about two, to, 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 to think about two core questions. So what? do I think music is? And what do I think new music does in today's world? All right, so what is music? I often see a statement on the website of many music schools saying that music is a universal language to communicate emotions and ideas across cultural and linguistic boundaries. 
But I'm always skeptical about this because how universal it is. Okay? So this statement is made based on a kind of Eurocentric understanding of what music is and assume everyone understanding music in the same way. So if we break away from that Eurocentric thinking and not perceive music from a Western perspective, so there are actually many instances that demonstrate music is not universal. So what, one, one very well-known example is that um, Igor Stravinsky, who is a very um, famous, well-known composer, he watched um, a performance of Chinese opera in Paris in 1933. All right? So his comment on that music is neighing, barking, and grunting. So apparently, the music from Chinese opera did not really communicate any emotion to him except for the dislike. So another example is taken from a more recent musicology research. So a UK research team went to a rural village in Pakistan, and those villagers have very little access to music of outside world. So the team played them music of different styles, such as classical, pop, jazz, and even heavy metal. Okay. And the team found that these villagers do not perceive emotion in music in the same way as most people did. Okay? So it is kind of clear that music is not really universal in communicating emotion and ideas. But nevertheless, this research sparked my interest to learn how other people think about my music. And I am very um, 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 interested in learning how uh, the opinion about audience from audience because it might lead me closer to answer the question, what is music? Okay. So I deliberately overhear um, the audience after the performance of my music and scroll through the comments uh, section under my, my music video on YouTube and to look for interesting comments. So here are some of them, which I think are really interesting. Your music is ugly to listen to, there's no melody. All right, next one. I don't know how to understand this. It's like listening to traffic on high, in highway. Um, the next one is from one of our fellow fellows. Uh, your music is chaotic. Now, the fourth one, which I think is the most interesting one. Your music is completely Western in style, and you have an Asian name, but you get an English name to please the Western audience. Anyway, good piece. <laughs> Um, well, the fourth comment is actually under a YouTube video of my piece, which I'm going to show you later. And, and this comment is originally in French, so I Google translate it. But I believe the uploader, I, I don't upload my music, so it's someone upload my music. Anyway, um, so I believe the uploader has removed it due to it, it's kind of being inappropriate, but I really want to do a screen capture of that. Um, so anyway, all of these comments are kind of negative comments, but I really enjoy reading them. You know, I know you know people are really good at being mean, and you know you will definitely learn something from what people are good at. Uh, and of course, I don't think our fellow is mean, right, Yaya? Uh, uh, I, I see creativity in this comment, and most importantly, I see how people like to perceive music. So, the first comment, consider a melody, right? And the second comment, ex expect for a Western-style soundscape. The third comment thinks about organization, structure, and form. And the fourth comment actually, actually considers some sort of like cultural perspective. Um, but these kind of concerns are indeed some sort of constraint that shape our music perception in certain directions, right? And they limit the way of how we understand music. So what I'm looking for is whether there is a way to approach music from an even broader perspective, a definition that can cover every kind of music. So now let's bring back the 
concept of Taoist universe, which asks us to look at things based on the true nature without um, value judgment. All right. So I try to discover what is the true value of music, and I look into what is in common in, in every kind of music. So as most music school will teach, music consists of these things. So rhythm, we have pitch, and then we have um, um, timbre, which sometimes you call color, it, which means the quality of sound. And then we have harmony, melody, and then we have dynamics, which is the loudness. And then we have form and structure, and sometimes they will include cultural or social meaning. Okay. But actually not every type of music includes all of these aspects. So are they really essential in music? So let's consider soundscape music, which is some sort of background sound in, in whatever, let's say, uh, a department store or whatever. So those music might not necessarily have rhythm, because sometimes it's just a block of moving sound mass. So it, it's really a, just plain abstract soundscape. soundscape. So it, so because it's a sound mass, it don't have form to. And now let's, let's think about drum music, like African drumming or snare drum marching thing. So there is definitely a rhythm, but there is no melody, no harmony. Okay? So how about cultural and social meaning? But let's think about what cultural meaning means. So it implies some sort of value judgment. Um, and cultural difference arise because we have uh, various cultures make different judgment about various things, right? But remember, we are now under the Taoist universe, and we don't consider value judgment. And value judgment is insignificant because we are all equal in nature. There's no way, no, no point to compare to compare with other people. So, if we think in this way, cultural and social meaning are not significant at all. So, what left? in music uh, is these things, pitch, timbre, and dynamics. And they all belong to one single aspect, which is sound. All right. So without all sort of unnecessary items and value judgments, music equals to sound. Okay. So it implies that when we hear whatever sound, we could just adjust our aesthetics to appreciate, to appreciate whatever sound as if we are listening to music. All right? Now, this may sound strange. This may sound strange. But we actually did similar thing in certain occasions. Now, imagine you are in an art museum, and you, there, there are three paintings in front of you. So one of them is a very classical painting, it's like Mona Lisa, and the second one is a more modern painting by, let's say, Picasso. And the third one is an even more contemporary, abstract painting. So when you look at them, you will be most likely using three different aesthetics to look at those paintings. You are not going to use the same aesthetics for all three paintings, right? Because, and, and we kind of automatically adjust our aesthetic to, uh, to appreciate three different styles of art. And we might even not realize that we have done the adjustment. But when it comes to music, people are more conservative, and they try to think only in, in a traditional way, and they tend to stick to one aesthetic and are less willing to adjust it, I, which I don't know why. But for me, the idea of changing aesthetics to hear any kind of sound as music is really important. It allows me to appreciate a broader range of sound. And it helped me to get through many boring lectures when I was in, in, in college, and because I turned the voice of my teacher into music. Um, OK, so if all sound can be considered as music, the world of music suddenly expands a lot. So whenever I was walking on the street, exercising, I consciously listen to music in my surrounding and try to perceive them as music. Now, keep in mind that the value judgment um, 
is insignificant under the concept of Tao's universe. So what I experience in those surrounding sound is not the beauty of sound. It is the fluidity of how sound flow. And I feel the energy flow. I feel how different sound expand and they come together. And I feel the freedom in their movement. All right? So now that sound can be considered, not all sound can be considered as music. So I'm not any more restricted to write for instrument in a traditional manner. Right? So I can experience with non-traditional techniques to create sounds on traditional instrument. And these techniques are often referred as extended techniques, and it, it is very common in contemporary music. And they are widely used by composers with different aesthetic and different approach. So let's say, for example, normally a pianist played on the keyboard of the piano, right? But this is how I played. All right, so that's why I kind of reject for the piano performance in, in, in Bright Biolet. Um, um, so if you, are, if you are wondering how it would sound like, so here is a one minute excerpt from my piece which demonstrates how it would be. Now, on the right side is one page of that score. If any fellow would like to see the entire score, I can show you after the talk. So the, now the piano can produce a much wider range of sound beyond just the note played on keyboard. The good side of writing in such a way is that it is economically efficient, you know, because the pianist become a one-person orchestra, and I don't need extra resources to hire um, other musicians. The downside is that many pianists whom I have worked with told me that they have developed a back pain after playing my piece. <laughs> um, so after I experience a much wider sound world, and, and when I get back to listen to conventional music, it seems less interesting. What, what I feel about the traditional composers is trying to compress everything into a narrowly defined box that we call music. But don't get me wrong, I mean, conventional music is still beautiful under the conventional aesthetics. But, just, but like, listening to, to them is like visiting a museum and look at all those um, ancient clay pots, uh, jars and mugs and cookwares that, uh, um, that are a thousand years old. And I like to go to the museum and look at those artifacts and try to understand how, how, how our ancestors live and, and how, what is the lifestyle. But more often, I'd rather go to a department store and stare at those pots and pans for hours. You know, at least I feel some sort of connection 
and relevance to today's world. All right? So what I think new music does. So the new music is something like those modern pots and pans. It should somehow reflect the nature of today's world. And this should not be, uh, belong to museums. But as a composer, how should I make music work in this way? So five to six years ago, um, when Hong Kong was still going through all sorts of like, political unrest, and by that time, I, I still had not developed my current musical approach, uh, a, mu a current compositional approach. And I was thinking, is there anything I can do with my music to, uh, to articulate that situation? But should I transcribe what I heard in the music? But then I think, this is not what I want my music to do. So one day when I was watching news about that social events, I suddenly had a very strange feeling that I was kind of immersed in the flow of that social environment. I mean, it is kind of difficult to express in words. But when we, because when we typically think about immersive experience, we think about immersive art or immersive soundscape. But in, in this instance, I felt like I was immersed or completely absorbed in the history of um, um, time year, 10-year ten, uh, ten time span. So I was kind of swept up in the ebb and flow of the history, kind of passively experiencing how a society shifts from stable to chaos. So, and, and even now, I find this, this um, experience kind of peculiar. So I suddenly realized that maybe I could relate this experience to my music, because I see some sort of sim similarity between this experience and how I want my music to be. So I simply want my music to break away from constraint, right, and to achieve a state of free flow, like, how, like the characteristic of the surrounding soundscape. So these two, these two things remind me of the Western scientific idea of entropy. So it is a, a measurement of disorder, and it is a universal phenomenon that states all things tend towards disorder, and our world is no exception. So this means that this order of ours is increasing, increasing over time. Now, if I bring back the Taoist universe concept that asks me to look at things, the true nature of all things, and I use this concept to look at entropy and our world, it seems that becoming disorder is one of the nature of today's world. And I thought maybe I could experiment with the idea of disorder in my creative process to make my music reflect today's world. So I, sim so I simply made a guideline for myself of how I want to compose, just to follow my spontaneous thought. Okay, so there would be no planning in, adv in advance. I have no expectation of how it would sound like and there will be no structure in the music. I just write what flows into my mind. So by doing so, the embodiment of entropy is within the creative process, but not inside the final product. The final product, which is the music, is the result of that entropic process, and it has high entropies. So put it in Yaya's word, it is chaotic. Um, and then the first piece, I create using this compositional approach is called Reaction 2, which is a solo violin piece lasting about eight minutes. I composed it during the, the, the period when Hong Kong is, is all in that political turmoil. But this piece is not specifically about that unrest. It's more about my immediate, immediate reaction to that chaotic situation. So it took me about seven days to complete this piece. And every day, I would watch some news about the unrest, and then I would sit back and try to feel what, what sounds come into my mind, I will, and I would write them down as a part of my composition process. And after I finish the piece, I have no idea how it will sound, and the first thing come to my mind when I read the score is like, it is very messy. And I don't know why I have, I'm brave, in, brave enough to send the piece to a festival and ask the violinist Irvin Aditi, who is the legend of the legend in the composition of the contemporary music world. 
to perform this piece, and he did perform it. So um, I'm going to play you the piece. So when you are listening to the piece, try to get away from value judgment. Immerse yourself in the music, just feel the flow, okay?
Okay, um, thank you, thank you. So, yes. so the, next, the next piece I'm going to play you is the main project that I finished here at Radcliffe. So it's called the Zooplankton. It's written for eight instruments and will be performed by the Hong Kong New Music Ensemble. So the people in the ensemble are very nice and they write me a, a very little description of, uh, for my piece. So imagining the sound of a fish is challenging. What about zooplankton? The Hong Kong-based composer Ka composer Tan was inspired by a documentary to paint a sonic world of this colony where you don't find patterns. It expands, shrinks, and floats. Well, I like this, this uh, description a lot, especially for the last sentence, it expands, shrinks, and floats. Because it, it exactly captures how I feel about sound when I'm listening to the, to the surrounding sound. Um, that document shows a time-lapse video of the life of a colony of zooplankton. So the movement, the growth, and the collapse of that colony is a very great um, um, uh, visualization of how I think a, a, a sound should work. So again, there's no plan for this, um, uh, for this piece before I start composing. I just let the sound flow naturally and lead their own way in music and try to expose the nature of the sound movement. So um, when I play the piece later, again, I want everyone to just feel the flow of the sound and get away from the value judgment thinking. All right? And the video I'm going to play to you is a rehearsal of this piece. Um, the ensemble and I have just refinished the rehearsal on Monday. And they are efficient enough to send me the video for today's presentation. And for my fellow fellows, I've sent you the score this morning, and so you can download it and read it from your uh, electronic device. So if you want to read from hard copy score, there are score on four corners um, at, at the hall, so you can grab one. And originally, I thought I would only play you an excerpt, but the ensemble plays so well, so I decided to play the whole thing. And what you're going to hear should be the world premiere of this piece. Although it is not a formal performance, it's a rehearsal. But anyway, the video is a little bit out of focus, but this audio is good.
All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so what I present to you today is my own perspective on music and how I approach composition. So I believe there are many composers out there holding very different viewpoints, and that's great because diversity is essential for the contemporary music scene. So I hope you understand the content of my talk today, and if you don't, try adjusting your aesthetic and imagine you have just listened to a long music performance, and I think you'll be better. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating work. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. There are loads of interesting questions, so let me get going with this. How does one divorce oneself from the value judgment when composing or even listening to any work? Again? So how does one divorce oneself from the value judgment both when composing and when listening to the work that you've, uh, you work on? Um, it's, it's really hard to tell because it's all, almost like a a training of meditation, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it really takes time to help you to become kind of objective from what you heard and hear things as what it should be. And there is no good way, exact way to, to, to um, train, I should, get, I should say, mm -hmm. because it's, it's more, more, more about like personal meditation experience. Mm -hmm thing. So let me get to the second yeah. question, which follows up on what you just said. So repeated listening is critical, is a critical part of learning to appreciate music. What do you think will be the effects of repeated listening to disordered music? I mean, this, uh, the questions talk about disordered music, I talk about your music. So how, how do you, what does the change looks like from the first time you listen to it to how one feels after, or think, or whatever, after listening for a few times? This is a good question. Because for most time, I don't listen to a piece of music for a second time, <laughs> even for my piece. Okay. And uh, um, let me think about it. Because what I'm listening to is, is actually not a f the beauty of the sound, what I say, I, it's just I feel about the energy flow and once I feel the flow already disappear and when I hear it the second time, it would not be the same thing again anyway and I don't want to get the same flow again, the same feel again. Mm -hmm. So, well, this is my aesthetic. I, I, I don't know if it is the, the answer he wants <laughs> anyway. Right, yeah. Right. So, you said that your environment shapes the music that you write to some extent. Yeah. I mean, you talked about yeah. the protest in Hong Kong, etc. How does the music that you wrote in Hong Kong compares to the music that you write here in Massachusetts? There's no difference, because mm -hmm. I can watch the news from Hong Kong through internet. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Good point. <laughs> yeah. So, while cultural and social meanings fade away with Taoist approaches, where might feeling fit in? Can music have feeling, or is it uh, that culturally defined? Now, this is a very good question. I don't think music has feeling. Uh, people has feeling, right? When you listen to a piece of music, whether you have emotion or whatever, it, it's based on your personal experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I write, I try to be kind of more objective in what I'm, I'm presenting. So whether they will have feelings or what kind of feeling they will have, it, it's, it's really their experience. And that's why I kind of like to uh, get the comments from audience mm -hmm. and see their faces when listening to this, this kind of weird things and then their face crumble, you know. And, and where's the second question again? Uh, it was, can music have feelings or is it that culturally defined? Culturally defined is a good, good way to put it. But I am also kind of skeptical about the cultural defining um, idea. Now, um, 
There is one type of music played by the indigenous people in the Arctic Circle, which is so, which sounds like um, they cannot breathe. It, it's basically it's a breathing. So Inuit people, it's a breathing sound, uh, throat, throat, throat singing. We call that. So I originally decided to show, show that clip when those Inuit people singing and Prince Charles, which is now King Charles, actually giggles because you know it is not what they imagine of, about music. Now imagine a situation like this. You are, uh, it is a normal Sunday, and you are walking a dog outside a pavement, okay, quietly, peacefully. And then on the opposite side of the pavement, there's a man walking and humming a song, but they are not humming, but he is not humming a melody. He is humming something like what the Inuit people are doing. So it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> all right? And then if you don't have the idea of, of um, this is the Inuit people music in mind in advance, what would be your first impression? What would be your first reaction? I believe most people would be like, what, the, what, what he is doing, right? And, and why is he making such a weird sound? So it, to me, it seems like using cultural thing to define music is really, um, I don't know, it's really tripling because it means that if you, if you know that culture, that is music. If you don't know that culture, that is not, that is not music. Even that is music, right? So, I don't know, because for me, for a, pers uh, for a subjective standpoint, I think culturally, uh, cultural meaning is some sort of boundary mm -hmm. to constrain me to listen to the real thing of music. Um, let's see. Let's get to this question. Um, in the in the one minute clip that you played first, how much improvisation goes into performance like that versus strict adherence to a written score? I mean, is there any improvisation in that? Um? It depends on how you define improvisation because mm -hmm. I did not put the rhythm very exactly. So actually, based on they, they can collaborate with a singer and, and a piano. Um, um, it's based on how the singer sings the melody, and the piano can do whatever, ever written, written in the score in whatever timing. So it's really about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And well, if you if you say that this 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 kind of flexibility is also called improvisation, so that is improvisation. But what I think is like more 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 on a flexibility side rather than an improvisational side. Yeah. So here's a question. What auditory experiences trigger most of your musical inspiration? Again? What auditory experiences trigger most of your musical inspiration? Every sound can trigger my, my inspiration. I mean, it, it really depends on what I heard on the street and, mm -hmm. and, and, and my surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. So for a quiet environment, like in, in a Bailey Hall office, I did not imagine anything. <laughs> 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 so sometimes maybe I, I went to a concert with, let's say, Maxine. Maybe they're playing Beethoven, but my, my brain is thinking another thing about how if I crashed the sounds of Beethoven together, what would it sound like? So there's, there's another kind of, of, uh, of inspiration. So it really depends. Not, there's not, nothing really specific about which, which type of sound trigger me, triggers my inspiration. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to hear that the golf is in Bailey Hall doesn't trigger anything, which means that there is silence, <laughs> which is <laughs> what we want. <laughs> Thank you, Kaju. Thanks. This was extraordinary. Thank you so much yes. for the presentation and for answering our questions. I also want to thank the audience for your questions, and I want to remind everyone that this uh, public talk, as well as all the others, are going to be online with all the other public events that Radcliffe puts up, and there will be video of past events and future events when they come up. And they're going to be at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.